The modifiable array unit problem is a statistical bias that occurs when counting things inside of bigger things. That's it. So when analyzing spatial data, for instance bars, that would be in districts, those districts being in spatial units like towns, um, us statisticians and cartographers tend to aggregate the data to, by unit areas like so or like so. And by doing so, we get a new summarized information that has many benefits. Like first of all, this summarized information ensures a form of confidentiality. Aggregating data makes it possible to represent data that was confidential before that's now erased. And also, it makes the information more intelligible. And appropriable. The information now displayed on the second maps that you see, the information becomes the qualifier of the subject district or the subject city and therefore can be used in decision making, content or politics. But now you should see me coming as many maps used in politics and in the medias in general, they display a simple yet biased version of reality. And in fact, by aggregating data, the analysis faces two main problems. If we have the population in different districts of a city and the poor population inside of those districts, by aggregating the data, we first get a scale effect. Depending on how we count the data in the different districts, we get quite different results. For instance, if we cut our city in nine districts, we get results up to 50% poverty, whereas if we cut it our um, array of study in three different spaces, we don't go up to 50, but to 34 maximum. So even though the smaller units preserves detailed local specificities, it makes the analysis more sensitive to statistical noise, to data quality and accuracy. And second of all, we also get a zoning effect. In the, depending on the contours of the spatial units, if they are very heterogeneous, such as here, the absurd phenomenon is likely to be profoundly modified. And you probably already know this image from the Canadian Cartographic Association shows how the, the way you cut your town or your city or your country in districts you can have very different results for an election. So, how can we obtain a cartographic representation that is free from an ad administrative and spatial unit that is simple enough to highlight trends, but at the same time complex enough to reveal underlying spatial structures? Where here for me is the main question that, it, that is answering cartography in general. For me, there's a balance we have to make and do cartographic compromises between showing simple things but complex enough to not hide the reality underneath it. And the main purpose of mapping is uh, and I'm citing Christian Grataloo, which is a French geo-historian Mapping societies enables us to situate them in relation to one another, to show how, hist how their histories are both singular and common. And so for their histories to be common, we have at some point to summarize the information. But he, he also adds, mapping is not without risk. We must learn to worry of the images produced, which are often seductive but biased by the implicit staging of the world they project. So, the first solution to avoid the mob would be to not count things into things, to show all the data, raw data. It's quick and easy, it shows the transparency of the data being used, but 
at the same time, we lose the confidentiality we talked about before. And on those kind of maps, you can only really show one info or else it becomes too crowded. Here, you have an example of a, of a map made with QGIS in five minutes, showing the superposition of label attesting the origin and quality of food products in France. And so the quick solution is to just simply display the raw data. It could be points, line, polygons, and display them with 10% opacity or even less. And therefore, when they superpose, they become more opaque. And so on this map, you can see in bright purple the areas where there's a, a lot of quality and food products produced and areas where there's almost none of them. But this kind of uh, representation might be too complex and is not really giving a spatial analysis of the phenomenon. So we need a second solution. Second solution would be to summarize data with good old statistic methods, such as the mean point or center of gravity, obtained by averaging the coordinates of the points considered. And here we have an example of the illustration of the major stages of the spread of population in the United States. It's a pretty famous map. And as far as this solution was great to be used here, since we had to summarize the distribution of the population for many years, it might not be the best tool to use when we have just one data set for one year, uh, summarizing it with only one point. This solution is maybe gives us a map that is way too simple and that forgets a lot of things. So we have to come up with a third solution. That would be to create a regular grid. And this solution is an intermediate solution. As we talked about before, it's a compromise because we here retain the advantages of aggregation that we talked about, the, the fact that it's being simplified, it's intelligible information, it's kind of anonymous. But now we are doing it based on a regular grid made with mathematical solutions rather than political intentions. And uh, I should add, the grid should ideally be made of hexagons because hexagons reduce the sampling distortions, as we can, you can see there, caused by the sectional effects of the grid shape. Though here, you might say that we are still be counting things inside of things. So we need to find another solution. But at least with that intermediate solution, that's still maybe too simple, we get rid of the zoning effect, having a regular grid. So my final solution would be to smooth the data. It's the solution that for me lowers the, zone ef the zoning effect as much as the scaling effect. And here you have, with the kernel density estimation, also called KDE, that counts around each point of our data sets, the points near it in a normal distribution, meaning if you're closer to the point, to the point near, you count more than if you're further from that point. But at that point, you might say, but Maggie, we are still counting things inside of things. Well, indeed, you're kind of right. But here, the grid, the grid created is fully designed to correspond to the spatial distribution of our data. And from my experience, smoothing spatial data in a form of heat maps, such as here, uh, results in a simplified yet precise representation close to reality as its rather organic forms displays it. And here you have an example of a recent project I came, I, I did, showing the superposition of different heat maps of different colors. You have, for instance, in red, the, the density of public transports, 
in green the density of um, workplaces, in brown the density of shops, and showing all those densities uh, one uh, with the other, we we're looking for the places of urban density. And what is urban density is the places where we have to target the public policies that will occur. So that was what I did recently at my job. So it's for me the more balanced way of uh, presenting those kind of data without uh, and lowering the mob problem. And here will be my conclusion. You can't really escape the modifiable area unit problem. But you can mop it quite well by being conscious of its zoning effect and its scaling effect and trying the best to lower these effects on your analysis. That's all, thank you.